It is quite literally front page news now that real estate commissions have changed forever. Now, what does this mean for you, the consumer, whether you are a buyer or a seller around the country? Well, that's what we're going to be covering in today's video. This is Daniel Gould, everyone with Gould Capital coming to you with a bit of a different episode. I shot this video primarily for my real residential real estate business in Silicon Valley. But given how much uncertainty and confusion there is around this topic, I figured that I would bring you snippets and highlights of the video that I shot surrounding the NAR settlement for all of you guys to be able to consume and understand some of the changes and everything that, that that are happening. Because let me be very transparent. If you ask 10 realtors or 100 realtors about the coming changes and what that means for them and what that means for you, you're gonna get 100 different answers. And so I've done a tremendous amount of research, gone deep into all of these changes and have made this video. I've made this video especially for you. Whether you're a home buyer, whether you're a home seller, whether you're a residential investor, there are changes that impact you directly. And so let's dive into the changes. Let's dive deep into the pros and cons and what you can expect as the consumer moving forward as we all tackle these changes together. What I'm going to be doing right now is reading some excerpts directly from the National Association of Realtors website and then giving my analysis on these rules and regulations. First thing that the consumer needs to know, a written buyer agreement is required prior to a buyer touring a home. An MLS participant working with a buyer can enter into the written buyer agreement at any point, but must do so by no later than prior to the buyer touring a home unless state law requires a written buyer agreement earlier in time. Now, there are states that even before this commission lawsuit passed or happened, they required agency agreements to be signed with agents. So buyers and agents had to sign an agency agreement before embarking in their business relationship together. But here in the great state of California, that agency relationship form no, did not need to be signed. It existed. It's always existed. But up until this point, it is no longer optional. Now, the important thing to note here is that this agreement needs to be signed before touring a home. And these written agreements are required for both in-person and live virtual home tours. So even if you're not stepping foot inside of the property, let's say that you're an out of state buyer, but your agent is walking the property and taking you through like a FaceTime or something like that, that also counts as a tour and you need to sign an agency agreement before the agent is allowed to do that. Now the buyer agreement must include four components concerning compensation. Number one, a specific and conspicuous disclosure of the amount or rate of compensation the real estate agent will receive or how this amount will be determined. In other words, you have to agree to a going rate for your agent services. Now this can be either, and it goes on to say compensation that is objective. So it needs to be either a flat fee, a percentage or an hourly rate and not open-ended. Now, which simply means like, hey, the buyer broker compensation shall be whatever the amount the seller is offering to the buyer. So before you could say something along the lines of, hey, we're gonna work together and whatever the seller offers us is what we'll take. That's open-ended. That is no longer legal. That is no longer permissible and it is not a valid compensation or buyer's agency agreement if you include verbiage like that. By the way, this also notes that you can literally put in the agreement that the buyer's agent will be paid zero dollars. That is correct. So a compensation could literally mean zero dollars or one dollar or a cent, literally anything, but it has to be specific. Now, I don't know what kind of agent would ever agree to like zero dollars or a dollar, but it's a possibility. You know, I take that back. If it's your family, or you've got some close connection to this person and they're gonna do you a solid or whatever, like I could see these sorts of agreements being drafted at zero dollars or a dollar or whatever, because at the end of the day, this agreement needs to be in place in order for you as the agent, so me as the agent, to be able to show you as the buyer a house, I would need this agreement signed before we even go in to the house. Like it would be not legal for me to do that, which is crazy to think about, but it is 100% the reality in this current market. Now, term number three is an interesting one. It says a term that prohibits the agent from receiving compensation for brokerage services from any source that exceeds the amount or rate agreed to in the agreement with the buyer. In other words, let's say that a seller decides to give a 3% commission to the buyer's agent, but the buyer's agent only has an agreement for two and a half percent signed with their buyer. Well, the buyer's agent can't receive that additional half percent. Now we're going to get into how this impacts sellers in just a moment. So if you're a seller, just hold on here. We're going to, or you can skip forward if you really want to, but this is important because 
sellers are buyers and buyers are sellers, right? So at the end of the day, you're going to eventually need to know all of this information. So you might as well stick around for the whole thing. And then finally, a conspicuous statement that broker fees and commissions are fully negotiable and not set by law. Now, this is one of the things that you know, was argued in the case. Uh, and, and we're not going to get, by the way, we're not going to get into the semantics or the logistics or why this case even was settled to begin with. You know, if you ask me, there was definitely a lot of ambulance chasing in this particular lawsuit. These are serial litigators, people that make it their livelihood to sue anyone and everyone. And that's how they make their money. Right. And so if you ask me, I think that there's a lot of ambulance chasing in this. The argument that all of this is in the best interest of the consumer is questionable at best, because as we're seeing right now in real time, there's a lot of confusion. And with these new rules, there's definitely the ability for some bad players to take advantage of the current situation and actually make it worse. So I don't necessarily see this as the greatest change ever. There are some pros, there are some cons, and we're going to be going over all of those pros and cons, by the way in this video, so stick around. Another thing that NAR points out is that you do not need a written agreement if you are just speaking to an agent or at an open house or asking them about their services. So you really only need it to engage a agent to show you houses that are not publicly available for viewing, right? So if it's an open house, you don't need to like sign an agency agreement with the agent who's holding the open house. That's that's not the case. Now, again, if you're a home buyer, you're unrepresented, you go to an open house, you wanna make an offer on it. The representative there isn't the seller's representative, but they are an agent in that brokerage or even an agent in a different brokerage, which there's a lot of gray area there. You know, there's a lot of gray area. And I know that the intent, so to speak, was to make it better for the consumer. But this is one of those things where this isn't necessarily like making it any easier or making life better for the consumer. At least I don't see it that way. Again, NAR drives home this point of commissions between buyers, sellers, everyone being fully negotiable. And this is something that we're going to cover, especially when we talk about sellers, where this concept of like sellers pre fixing a certain commission that they're going to give to the buyer's agent, that is going to go completely out the window. And the reason being that if you are a seller, well, Hold on a second. We'll get into that in a second. Let's cover the buyers first and then we'll get into the sellers because you'll see now exactly what I'm talking about where this negotiable is going to cause a lot of friction in a multiple offer situation. You'll understand what I mean in a second. Now, one thing to know on the buy side is that these agency agreements do not need to be exclusive. And so the agreements can be exclusive, meaning that you can agree to for a finite period of time. Let's just say for all agreements, three months. And so there is a finite period of time that these uh, agreements can be written for. Now, obviously you can create an amendment afterwards and like renew the agreement, assuming that you don't find a home within three months but these agreements do not necessarily need to be exclusive. Again, this is where some bad players can really start to take advantage of the situation because it is very quickly going to become common knowledge that buyer agency agreements are necessary in order to tour homes. And some bad players who are not very good at their job, but they're really good at conning people can go ahead and tell the buyers, hey, you need to sign this agreement. And the buyer is going to be like, oh, yeah, I saw that on the news. But they're not going to notice that that agency agreement is 100 percent exclusive. And so if that buyer, you know, gets tricked by a bad player into signing one of these things, then they are locked in a contract for three months. You know, if that agent doesn't deliver on their promise and if they're a bad player, they're probably not, you know, doing a lot of work for them. Right. They're not looking for off market properties. They're you know, not facilitating the best possible consumer experience, but they're asking for exclusivity, right? So great agents can ask for exclusivity because they understand their value and they know what they're delivering. But this is where I believe we're going to see a lot of lawsuits and issues come up is where bad players take advantage of the now common knowledge that every buyer needs to have a written agreement with their agent and then turn it on its head in order to con unsuspecting buyers into signing exclusive agency agreements with them that they can't get out of. So this is why it's super important. And NAR even tells all of the consumers, like you need to be asking the hard questions, like ask them about their services. What is it that they bring to the table? What's your value proposition? And understanding the totality of what that agent's going to do for you. Also look online, you know, Google is a beautiful thing. And usually bad players will get exposed or bad players don't have an online presence. It's really easy to spot bad players because if they've been in business for 13 years and have no reviews online, they probably aren't very good at their job. I'm just gonna, I, you know, I don't wanna call people out, but like if you've been in business for 10 years 
and you can't be found. Like there's no trace of you online. Either you don't do any business or you screwed a lot of people over and you're trying to wipe the internet. Any breadcrumbs that could lead the consumer into figuring out that they're not so great at their job. In fact, they, they screw people over consistently. Now, one might argue, well, you know, buyer agency agreements have always been in place and there have always been bad players that have tricked buyers into signing exclusive agreements. Sure, that's always happened. And I definitely have run into it a fair number of times in my now decade long career. That's scary to say. Okay, so sellers, you can no longer advertise commission. All right, so you can no longer advertise on the multiple listing service, which you used to be able to do, offer a cooperating compensation to the buyer's agent. You can agree to offer something of a concession to buyers as a means to pay commission. And commission sharing was deemed to be antitrust. And so you are no longer paying your listing agent for both sides of the transaction, just their services. So this is another gray area, right? Where I think maybe in a year or two or three years from now, it'll be common knowledge that these are the changes. But there's a lot of sellers who are not privy to you know, the, the internet and gosh, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking of, of, you know, some, some of the, and not to single them out, right. But like, I'm just thinking of some of the older folks, right. Who may not be so quick to be, uh, you know, gathering information and, you know, maybe they don't necessarily have children in their lives that care enough to guide them through this process. Like there are going to be some bad players who charge, you know, full, full commission. And we're talking, you know, five to 7% is typically like the range of, of commission that I've seen here in the Bay area for total sell and buy side, uh, you're going to see some bad players who charge that full amount and find a way to swindle the seller. Like that is one very obvious red flag that I see with all of this is you're going to have some bad players who, who take advantage of the situation. Now, you know, is every agent that does that, are they a bad player? You know, some could argue that that's their value, right? Sure. Although your value was like half of that a month ago, right? So, uh, okay. But it's an interesting thought experiment. You know, when, when you really think about the ramifications of the settlement agreement, I think that, you know, for in the short term, buyers are getting the raw end of the stick, right? Because more buyers are going to have to pay out of pocket commissions now than before. But there's also going to be a small subset of sellers who get conned by disingenuous con artists and they will fall victim to those agents and they might end up having to pay commission to the seller's agent and then also offer some sort of concession to the buyer's agent for their commission, right? And we'll, we'll get into why this, because everyone's like, oh, sellers don't have to pay commission anymore. That is not true, okay? Like, yes, in theory, but like, not really, dude, right? And so we're gonna get into all of that. But just like on the buy side, you can also see how bad players can take advantage of the situation on the listing side. And that's what really irritates me more than anything about this is, is these changes are aimed to protect the consumer, but I see a lot more consumers getting screwed over, especially in the short term, than I do being helped by this. And, and that that's interesting, right? That's very, very interesting that this is how it's all kind of playing out. Okay, next point for sellers. Since buyers agents can't collect more than the agreed upon amount between them and their buyers, it's prudent to advise everyone to make their offer. By the way, this is not from the NAR website. This is my own interpretation. Since buyers agents can't collect more than the agreed upon amount between them and their buyers, it's prudent to advise everyone to make their offer with whatever concessions they're looking for. So while commissions can't be advertised on the multiple listing service, if a buyer's agent calls me and asks me, hey, is the seller offering commission? Um, there's a couple ways I could answer that. I could say, uh, go take a hike. Not a smart move because of course, as the listing agent and as the seller, you want to be invited, right? You want everyone to make an offer on your property because the more offers, the more competition we have. Competition drives price. So this idea of like not wanting to cooperate with buyer's agents anymore with this idea of like, you know, screw those agents, like they're just being greedy. You're going to end up shooting yourself in the foot if you take that approach 100% guarantee you. You want to be open and inviting. So of course you could say, go take a hike. The second uh, mistake I think that you could make is say, yes, we are offering 2%. We're offering 2.5%. We're offering 3%. We're offering 1%. Here's the reason why. If you take a sample size of 100 agents and their buyer agency agreements, you're going to get all shapes and sizes of compensation that is agreed to by the buyer and the buyer's agent. Now, this is relevant to the seller because at the end of the day, the buyer's agent can only collect the amount of money that they've agreed to with the buyer 
not a penny more. So if you say, yeah, we're offering 2% and the buyer's agent has a agreement with their buyer for one, you're giving away a point of leverage, right? You're giving away a point of leverage. And so this idea of being negotiable throughout the transaction is actually one that's quite interesting. You know, shocker, we have to talk about money now, right? This is, it could be uncomfortable for some people, but it's actually kind of an interesting thing. It's actually one of the things that I find intriguing about this is that we have to find a way to make everyone win. And isn't that what a successful negotiation is when everyone walks away feeling like they won? And so it would be prudent. The third option is, and this is what I would advise, is that we simply say the seller is willing to entertain any and all offers with any and all concessions. Right. Now, this is not necessarily something that you can put in the MLS, but you can say, hey, call so and so for more information about this property. Right. And in that conversation, obviously, commission is going to come up. And as the listing agent, the best, the most prudent, at least at this point in time, with the information that we that we've been given and the guidance provided by the National Association of Realtors, it seems to me like the most prudent thing to do is to leave it open ended. Why? For example, let me, let me just throw this one at you. Let's say that the buyer's agent has an agreement with their buyer saying that they're going to offer one percent or that they're, they're going to work for one percent with the buyer. OK, they have a commission agreement with the buyer and the buyer's agent calls the listing agent and the listing agent says, yes, the seller's already agreed to two and a half percent. Oh, wow. There's an extra point and a half spread. Well, there is no law that says I can't go back to my buyer and say, hey, you know what? The seller is actually offering two and a half percent. Now, why don't we do this? Why don't we rewrite the agreement to say that I'm going to take the two and a half percent and I will rebate you a half point at closing, right? Well, buyer doesn't lose anything, right? Buyer doesn't lose anything because the seller's already agreed to that amount. And so this is why you want to leave it open-ended because the, the seller, by giving away a commission percentage over the phone or in any capacity, it actually weakens your position as a seller. As far as I'm aware, rebates to buyers are still very much a possibility. They're, they're still very much a thing. And so if the buyer's agent wants to like split the difference with their buyer, I say like, hey, the seller's offering 2% more than we agreed to. Do you just want to split that? I don't know which buyer in the right mind would say like, absolutely not. You know, you just amend the buyer's agreement and then write the contract. It's very simple. What this is going to do is really force the consumer as a seller to focus on what has always mattered, which is their bottom line. Sellers for decades now have been consumed with hiring discount agents and hiring agents that are going to do it for less. But at the end of the day, I think what this commission lawsuit, one of the benefits of this commission lawsuit is it's actually going to incentivize the best players. It's actually going to create more demand, I believe, for the best listing ag agents possible. Because listing property, as you can see, now becomes a whole hell of a lot more than just marketing the home and collecting offers. It really requires finesse when it comes to negotiating. And the negotiations matter so much more now, even more so, and not so much more, but more so now than they did before. And, and beforehand, negotiations mattered a whole hell of a lot. Now, let's talk about multiple offers, because in a multiple offer situation, like let's say you've got 10 offers, right? If you leave it open ended, you say, hey, all buyers offer what you want and, and ask for what you want. And we will entertain any and all concessions. Well, what this does is it will force you to look at every single offer Now, some offers might be higher in price, but also higher in commission. And some might be lower in price, lower in commission. And so what you really need to do is, is subtract out all of the fees and all of the concessions and really look at your bottom line as the seller. If the buyer includes some agreement that says the buyer's agent's supposed to make 10% on the deal, let them. 10% awesome. If they're the highest offered, they're willing to pay you more than any other buyer out there. Let them take to 10, 20 for all you care. Now, this does call into consideration of the imminent issue with appraisals. So yes, charge whatever you want to charge, but then also what's going to happen with the appraisal. And so this is one thing to keep in mind that appraisals may become an issue in this time period where prices are going to fluctuate and adjust. And we're going to have this period of stabilization where the market is reacting to these new rules and these new regulations in time. And so because commission's always been baked into the price, commission is still baked into the price, but you know, it is sometimes this buyer might say, hey, I've got 3% cash. I'm just going to pay my agent and keep the commission out of this conversation. Right. And, and so all of a sudden their purchase is 3% less than another home just down the block that sold with a 3% buyer's agent credit or concession. Right. And so there's going to be some period here. And by the way, one of the other issues with appraisals, as far as I know, there's no way for us to report at the end of the transaction what the concessions were in that deal. Right. So it's not like we could say like, hey, appraiser, this home sold for two million dollars with six percent total in commissions or this one sold for 
two point or one point nine with three percent in total commissions, right? So there's no way for the appraisers to actually know. And so this is where values are going to become a lot more inconsistent uh, because of the lack of transparency when it comes to commissions and closing costs. Whereas before everything was just baked into one neat price. So if you are a seller who is raising your price in order to accommodate concessions, make sure that the buyer has plenty of money to cover the difference if there's any sort of appraisal shortage or in an ideal situation, especially if you're in a multiple offer situation. Make sure that you're countering out that appraisal contingency so that the buyer is essentially forced to cover the cost if the appraised value doesn't come in and, and there's a discrepancy between, you know, what you were offered for the home and what the, the buyer is now kind of on the hook for based on the appraisal. Another thing to note is that your agent as a seller, for their first events, they will get fined thousands of dollars if any mention is made of commission, compensation, cooperation, anything like that in the multiple listing service, in the private remarks, in the public remarks, in hidden code, in sign language, like however, you know, if you put it in hieroglyphics, they will find a way to nail them. And so do not put pressure on your agent to advertise commission. Um, if they're smart, and they don't want to get fined, they will not do it. And 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 at this point, I, I don't know why as a seller you'd even want to do that, but it, it is worth noting that like that is no longer allowed. Now, one last thing to note here before we move on is I don't want you as a seller to just assume that you no longer have to pay buyer's commissions. I think this is one of the greatest fallacies that have come out of this whole settlement agreement is that sellers are now saying like, oh, I don't want to pay commission. I don't have to pay commission or you know something of that sort. Sure, you don't necessarily have to pay commission, right? But also the buyer can request to only see homes that are offering compensation, right? And so how would they know that? Well, I, as the buyer's agent, call the seller, the seller's agent, and the seller's, we ask the seller's agent, are you offering compensation? Now, if I say something along the lines of, we're open to any and all offers, you know, with any uh, sort of concession, that tells me as the buyer's agent that like the seller is reasonable and they're willing to work with us or if they just give a flat percentage, right? Like we're, we're offering 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%, whatever it is. That also tells me they're cooperating. But if the seller's agent says something along the lines of, you know, we, we're, we're, we're not offering compensation or they refuse to answer the question or they're just kind of like shady or weird about it. Well, that indicates to me as the buyer's agent that they're not cooperating, cooperating, quote unquote, they're not going to be offering a compensation. Now the buyer with that knowledge can then elect to like not see the house because in their mind, if you're not going to help them with their closing costs, they may not be able to afford that extra 3%. And so they might just choose to not go tour your house. And so at the end of the day, we, you as the seller, the best way to approach this is to stop thinking about commission and start thinking about net and being open to any and all ways to achieve the highest net possible, the highest possible money in your pocket. That's the best way to think about this as a seller. It's not, do I pay commission? Do I not pay commission? Screw real estate agents. You guys are just, you know, lazy, you know, bums. I've heard it all, you know? Um, and, and by the way, there, I, I don't disagree with all of it, right? Like there's definitely a lot of lazy bums in this, in this industry. I don't, I would not consider myself one of them, but uh, there are plenty of those out there. And so I, I'm not saying that you're wrong, but what I am saying is that it is the wrong approach to get the highest amount of money in your pocket. So to conclude this video, what I wanna do is just briefly run through some pros and cons that I've brainstormed about this settlement. As again, things are gonna change in, in due time and there'll be amendments and, and adjustments to probably my own viewpoint of this, right? Like I, I, I'm still trying to understand how I feel about all of this and my interpretation of these, of these changes. Are they good for the consumer? Are they bad for the consumer? Are they good for agents, bad for agents? I, I think that I'm still very much on the fence on, on both of those questions. Now, there are some very evident pros and cons for consumers. So let's just go into some of the the, the pros first for, for the consumer. Number one, transparency. There is some lack of transparency in some fronts, right? Like, so, you know, the fact that like, we don't get to see like what the commission is, like, we don't know, is seller going to cooperate? Is it, are they not going to cooperate? But when it comes to buyer agency agreements and, and having those conversations up front, I actually do see that as a pro, right? There's more transparency up front as to like, these are my services. This is what I'm going to do for you as a buyer's agent. And in turn, this is what my value is. And this is what I expect in terms of compensation. The cream will rise to the top. The cream will rise to the top. I really do believe that the best agents who provide a better experience for their consumer are going to be able to command more respect. And they're also going to be able to get more agency agreements signed, right? It's just kind of like listing agreements. Whereas before you really saw like, you know, a really s small fraction small, small fraction of the overall agent population in any given metro be 
strong listing agents. So thousands of agents, but like really only like a couple hundred take more than like six to 10 listings a year consistently in this market. And so when you think about the cream rising to the top on the listing side of things, well, the reason for that being that listing agents need to actually understand how to communicate their value, not just open a door. And now buyers agents are going to have to do the same thing before opening a door. They're going to have to, you know, clearly express and communicate their value. Now, do I think there's going to be more than a couple hundred agents that are able to do that? Probably. But I do think that you're going to see a lot more cream rising to the top, more agents controlling more of the market and in a lot of ways defeating the the entire purpose of this <laughs> settlement agreement, which was antitrust, right? We want to break up the monopoly. Well, and guess what? You're going you're gonna to create more of, an, of a monopoly by, you know, essentially putting the consumer in a position where they're forced, they're forced to interview agents, right? They're forced to basically hear an agent out and, and understand why is it that I should trust you with my home search. One of the other evident pros of this settlement agreement is that before when commissions were advertised publicly online commissions this idea that you know now sellers don't have to offer commission and before they did that's 1000 percent a lie and if you could i could go back on the mls right now and look at all of the listings that offered a dollar as the commission so literally in order to get published on the multiple listing service one of the requirements before one of the the prerequisites was that you had to offer a some sort of cooperation to the to the buyer's agent but again bad players take advantage of the rules these bad players would offer one dollar to the buyer's agent and their clients for the most part were completely unsuspecting well what did that force agents to do well a lot of buyers agents you know they don't have signed agreements with their buyers and so they're looking at that they're like i don't want to show my buyer that house i'm only going to get paid a dollar how am i supposed to tell my client that they now have to pay me you know two and a half percent to go see this house because 95 percent of the listings were offering two and a half percent in santa clara county and what this caused was inadvertent well not not inadvertent advertent steering right to the listings that offered at or above market value commission which in this market, I would say any listing that was at two and a half percent or above was kind of considered standard commission beforehand, right? And so you would see agents who didn't offer that take advantage of the situation, listing agents, because in knowing that agents weren't going to show their listings, guess what? They get to double end, right? Buyers come to them unrepresented. And so they're only, they're picking off buyers left and right that are unrepresented because the only buyers that are going to come see their house are the ones that aren't represented by agents because the agents that were working with buyers we're just not showing them those houses. And lastly, you know, there was not that there wasn't elasticity before compensation flexibility has always been around, but now there's just a little bit more transparency and buyers and, and agents really have to negotiate and come to an agreement as to what their worth is. Right. And also great agents like myself, we need to have contingency plans in place in case like a seller isn't just like 100 percent not willing to cooperate with us. And, you know, our buyers on the hook for three percent or 2%, whatever it is, right? But the buyer can't pay that extra 3% out of pocket, right? So what are the contingency plans in place? And so again, cream will rise to the top, but also, you know, this flexibility and compensation will, will, will force buyers and, and buyers agents to have difficult conversations that they probably should have always been having. But now is the conversations are going to be forced and, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Now, here are some very obvious cons, aside from the ones that I've already brought up, which is the ability for bad players on both the buy side and the listing side to take advantage of the situation, especially in the couple of months where there's still a lot of ambiguity, still a lot of confusion, a lot of questions. Like you could see absolutely some, some bad players taking advantage of the situation. In addition to those cons, the first one is that buyers are going to potentially be taking on more costs. And so this makes an already difficult market that much more difficult, right? We're, we're in one of the most expensive markets in the country. And for sellers to have to come up with an additional one, two, three percent out of pocket, it could be a deal breaker for some folks. And so that is definitely a con that we don't have a solution for right now, necessarily. And so there are some hacks right now that we've been deploying or have been strategizing around how to deploy to kind of like circumvent, not circumvent, but, you know, play by the rules, obviously, but then also be able to satisfy all parties, you know, uh, in terms of their original agreements, right? Because the last thing you want to do as a buyer, and I'm sure like most buyers would feel this way, is like if you commit to paying your agent something and you find a great house and you get in, you know, you're negotiating a contract and the only thing that's keeping you away um, is like, you know, a 2% difference in commission. I think that, you know, most ethical people would like, they, they want to stay true to their word, right? So it, as long as we can find a way for everyone to win um, and like where the agent isn't left like, the buyer's agent's the only one that's left screwed out of, you know, uh, screwed because they're like, okay, well, 
you know, I'll give up a bunch of my money just to get this deal through the finish line. You know, I'm sure that most buyers would leave with maybe a, a bad taste in their mouth, right? Not fulfilling your promise or not fulfilling your contractual obligations or uh, what you'd uh, initially agreed to. I'm sure like no one really, no one really wants that, right? At least I know that if I were in the buyer's shoes, I would want that. So another con would be more complexity in the negotiations. This is a big one. You know, of course, everything's negotiable, but at what cost, at what price? Uh, th this could add a lot of tension to negotiations. This could make some negotiations fall apart. I, I am 100% uh, convinced that we are going to see more transactions falling through or not necessarily transactions falling through in terms of like evident TFTs that would be published on the MLS because all of these would have to be negotiated up front. But there'll be a lot of negotiations falling apart because of this, a lot more than than were previously, most likely due to lack of negotiation competence, right? And so great negotiators can bring parties together and, and figure things out, right? And so that that's really gonna be one of our main jobs moving forward here as agents is to really help provide more clarity to the consumer and also bring two parties together. And, and find ways to bring parties together as opposed to allowing this to be the reason why parties drift apart. Another cod, limited access, we covered this earlier, but you know, if a buyer is unable to afford coming out of pocket and a seller is blatantly saying, you know, you talk to a seller's agent and they're saying, there's no way we're cooperating with you. The buyer's gonna be like, yeah, I'm not gonna see the house. So there's gonna be a subset of homes that were available before that are no longer available. now. One might suggest or one might say that like, oh, well, those are the sellers that would have offered a dollar before. Those are the ones that would have gone for sale by owner before, right? So I, I think that you're gonna see some some FISBO, some, some people that would have originally maybe opted to sell by themselves. Now, because of these laxer commission rules, you know, at least on their side, what they believe to be true, uh, they, they might opt to go the, the agency route. Well, you know, I think that we need, uh, of course, time will tell, but I definitely see, you know, some buyers uh, seeing a house that they want and then discovering before they, you know, make an offer that there's no way that given the seller's point of view on who's going to pay what, that they're now no longer going to be able to buy that house or compete for that house if it's in a multiple offer situation. So anyway, it's just things to consider, right? Risk of inequity is a big one. If not carefully managed, this system could put some buyers at a, at a massive disadvantage, right? If you're not as privy to the rules, if you're like we covered before, if you are, you know, cash strapped and you don't got, have a lot of ex excess cash uh, lying around, you you could get potentially miss out on some property. So any way you slice it, you know, these changes are at least in, in the short term, this could change in, you know, three to six months where smart people who are, you know, a lot smarter than you or me, hopefully figure this out and figure out, um, you know, how we can create products and, and, and maybe loan programs and whatnot. Like these are all things that have been talked about where, hey, can, can lenders find a way to like you know, bridge the gap or bake it into the loan outside of the appraisal. You know, these are all things that kind of you know, remain to be seen, right? But um, but at least for the time being, um, there, there could be some inequity there, some inequality, you know, due to, you know, lack of information or and lack of cash and so on. And then finally, the last con is just this state of confusion that I think the general marketplace is in. I think that, you know, change is hard. Change is obviously inevitable, but change is one of those things that really throws a lot of confusion into the equation. And so before things get easier, if they ever do, they're going to get harder. And before they get more clear, they're going to get more confusing. And so we're in that we're in that period of confusion right now and lack of 100% certainty as to like how this is going to impact everyone. I would just encourage you if you're a home buyer or a home seller, you know, really partner with an agent that, you know, when you're when you're talking to them, they instill confidence in you that this is not going to interfere with the end goal because at the end of the day these are just rules to work by but the end goal is still the same to buy or sell a house right and to buy it and to buy the best house for the best price possible or if you're in a multiple offer situation buy the best house and beat out 10 other offers right that's still the goal if you're a buyer if you're a seller the goal is still get the best possible price in my pocket the best possible net right and maybe we were focused more on list price before like sales price before than the net but now more than ever i think that the frame of mind really needs to focus around what is my net as the seller because with all of these different variables and everything like it doesn't matter like nothing else matters except your bottom line as the seller now i know this has been an exceptionally long video but if you've made it this far in the video and you are not yet subscribed to my channel what are you waiting for go ahead and click that subscribe button hit the notification bell to get notified every single time i post any video as it pertains to real estate i post a ton of real estate investing content on this channel also we'll be bringing you 
updates with the settlement agreement as they become available because as we know there's only one thing that we can expect from this is that this won't be the last time that there are changes and, and, and new updates that are going to directly impact you and so i will commit to bringing you the latest updates as it pertains to this agreement this is danny gold everyone with gold capital and i will catch all of you in the next video